maybe you can just mute. Okay, uh, hello, hello everybody. Like, uh, it's a pleasure to uh, welcome you to uh, to this policy forum on the integration of biodiversity and trade policy. So my, my name is Simon Happersberger. I'm a PhD researcher here at the Brussels School of Governance. Uh, and I, I have the pleasure to, to co-organize uh, um, this, this series uh, of policy forum uh, on biodiversity and economic policies uh, together with Jean Huch and uh, François uh, Gardin. You can say hello. hello. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> And uh, yeah, uh, so we, we we are very thankful to uh, to receive a bit of support by the Jean Monnet share uh, on uh, equivalence. Um, I'm especially thankful to have such a, um, a distinguished panel uh, of experts here today. Uh, so um, we uh, we we start uh, may, maybe just here. So so we have Madeleine Tuininga from the European Commission who is the head of unit on trade and sustainable development at DG Trade. Then we have uh, from the European Parliament, uh, Saskia Pigmont, uh, member of the European Greens. Uh, we have also online uh, Shunta Yamaguchi, who is a policy analyst at the Division for Environment and Economy uh, Integration at the uh, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. And uh, we, we have also with us Marianne Ketunen, uh, who is a senior policy expert uh, on trade uh, at the Trade Development and Environment Hub. Uh, so uh, thank you uh, very, very much for, uh, for, for, for joining this uh, panel today. So uh, today uh, we will speak about uh, the integration of uh, biodiversity and trade policies. And, and we do so um, against the background that in 2019, the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services pointed out that biodiversity is declining at an unprecedented rate. And also that international trade is one of the indirect drivers for, for this decline, actually. So in 2020, we, 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 we had the problem that none uh, of the IC biodiversity targets was uh, fully, uh, fully reached. And uh, since then, we, we see a couple of um, um, efforts on the, on the international level, but also on the European level to, to better integrate uh, trade policy and, and, and biodiversity. So on the international level, uh, we, we have seen the WTO agreement on fishery uh, subsidies uh, in June last year. And of course, in, uh, in December, we, we had the Convention on Biological... Uh, bio, uh, biologic, um, on Diversity. Yes, on uh, yes, uh, biological diversity in uh, in Montreal. So uh, the 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 guiding questions for for today's session uh, is what do these regulatory developments actually imply for uh, EU trade policy, and how can trade policy be better aligned with uh, with biodiversity protection? So uh, as structure for the panel, I, I would suggest that we first listen uh, to, the, uh, to the input uh, of, uh, of our panel. And, and after that, we, we will have a short discussion uh, before then, of course, we, we open up uh, to the audience. Uh, so um, for the people on joining online, um, please don't, don't hesitate to, uh, to put your questions uh, in the chat. Uh, or even like in the uh, in the Q and A part, you're also welcome just to turn on your cameras uh, and and ask your question um, via live stream. So we would also propose to to record just the first uh, part of the meeting, so uh, the prepared inputs of the uh, of the panelists, uh, and, and then later we we will turn off the recording so so that we can have a a, a bit more um, relaxed uh, discussion. So uh, without further ado, I, I will give the floor to Madeleine Twininga to provide uh, the European Commission's per perspective uh, on, the, on the topic of uh, trade policy and, uh, and biodiversity. So thank you very much and uh, I leave the floor to you. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for this challenging task. So you first get the technocrat and then you get the politician. <laughs> uh, but we work a lot together on this. Well, so I'm um, indeed I um, I'm a DG Trade, um, and we have in the unit um, three responsibilities. 
the first is a thematic responsibility of the trade and climate, uh, all the trade and the sustainable items. So whether it's labor, forced labor, uh, green human rights. Um, so the policy responsibility, then we do the multilateral, so the WTO, we have. Um, and all the autonomous measures. So the last years have been a lot on the Green Deal, um, but of course we follow also the trade aspects of the um, international developments. And, and the bilateral, so we have FTAs, but also not sustainable things, and GSP, General System of Preferences, is in another year. Um, and I fi find it a challenge because I find it always difficult to where you are um, and what is trade and why is this relevant and actually we are in the middle of that as well and I find it quite a challenge for biodiversity and I find biodiversity more complex than climate because the climate agenda is maybe more focused they're interrelated that eh? one is related but biodiversity is very 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 wide eh? you talk circular economy you, you have fisheries you have deforestation you have forestry so it, it's very very diverse and biodiversity probably also has more local things uh, climate is um, uncontested passes the border biodiversity can go about the bees that need to protect the field and then what's the trade dimension to it well maybe if the forest goes away and there are no more bees and you put their products that you export to europe there there is then an international dimension to it but but that makes the discussion challenging and also in trade terms because a lot of what we do today in rules and we, um, all these internal measures have an external dimension because they deal with supply chain so they impose also not direct but indirect obligations on, on producers and everybody who's in the supply chain in a third country and, and that's a bit of a novelty in trade normally you do stand up because it's safe but now you have a characteristic of a product that is because the way it was produced or the land that it used um, and, and then then there is a trade dimension but what is our role in there so that that's the complexity of it now maybe turning uh, to try to unravel it I, I, I thought I'll take three key takeaways of the um, uh, in particular what you say had the coming uh, I always have to with pronunciation Montreal global biodiversity framework uh, which is really like a landmark uh, um, moment comparable to Paris for, for climate. Um, and then I'll touch briefly on, on WTO and, and the bilateral agenda. So it is a very important new framework um, and it has delivered uh, the COP15, if you want, delivered in three main areas. An introduction of overarching goals to be met by 2050 and targets. So for example, this flagship 30 by 13 targets, I assume that you're familiar with that. And number two, it establishes a reporting and monitoring framework for national contributions. Very important. There was nothing before, so you need to uh, monitor that. And then three, it introduced a significant finance uh, target and goals to mobilize 200 billion US dollars by 2030. Uh, now, as I said, I, I think um, what can trade do is that, that one of the challenges is it's a very wide scope of areas. Um, and what else is also a challenge, and I'll get back to that, is that, of course, it's a, it's a landmark, it's a significant step forward. But when you talk trade, and particularly when you talk trade and the enforcement side of it, if there's no clear commitment, it's difficult to enforce it. So um, there are no shells, and there, there are very little shells. Um, and as I told, if you look at what can trade do, classically you look at trade as liberalization. Um, that's a bit of classical thinking. So if you facilitate circulation of goods and services that do good for the environment, if you want. But what I've seen is over the last four years, and certainly with um, the whole increase of the regulatory part and, and, and the Green Deal, is that actually the, the, the regulatory part has significant the relevance of it is just I mean a tariff is a tariff but the regulatory part is um, so incredibly important and then you need to look at what do I do there there's a big development into looking at if you take these autonomous measures not only international agreements but autonomous measures okay, how do you do that and what rules will you then comply and can you develop best practices now briefly um, we see a clear interest to talk biodiversity, really boosted. WTO has become a very important platform for discussing both environment and climate. I would say that where the perception is that the WTO is a bit dormant, we are extremely busy. I haven't counted it, but we have 
so many meetings per year and so many activities in plurilateral, multilateral. So the appetite is there. We're still a bit searching souls, I think, <laughs> with all the changes um, in the world. And of course, we are not the only ones there. There are many others. Um, uh, and it has for us become a very important platform to socialize the European Green Deal. I'm attacked every time we're there. Third countries accuse us of green imperialism. Um, uh, there is maybe a little bit in it because we are front runners, but um, at the same time, don't be in the defensive. I would say I think we need to explain and, and try to show how you do it and that we take um, third country interests into account so that we make it more acceptable. So very briefly, what we do with WTO, you gave a nice example of fishery subsidies. So that's where there's a clear negotiation, subsidies, a little bit of forced labor. You know. Um, and then th there's more, what I would say, topics in development, if you want. Circular economy is a hot topic. It's debated now over two, three years, trying to unravel it. What What is it? It's a topic that developing countries like in particular, because they say, you export uh, all the waste to me. <laughs> you need to help me process it, circular economy. Um, uh, discussion on plastics uh, is, is, is there as well. Um, and in a way, we're starting to discuss deforestation because we're discussing the EU measure all the time, which, which then gets to a discussion. Yeah, but isn't this what we all are looking for? Um, so um, now, as I said, what can we do? Um, it's not so much, I would say, if you look at the rules area, not so much. It, it's not the, 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 the new rules, I would argue. I, I would really say, A, how within the WTO system can we make sure that we can do these measures, the environment, and in a way that do respect um, uh, third countries, uh, you know, no discrimination and, and the basic rules. Um, I think there's a lot of scope to do uh, mapping what everybody's doing, um, best practices. Uh, how, how do you do these things that there's always this global spirit? In the end, we want global solutions. Um, and um, where I also see an unexpected big appetite is that somehow the trade community, because there's a lot of intelligence, and it's good that the OECD is here, also think tank, how do these supply chain work? It's not so easy. If you talk about deforestation, we're talking about a regulation that tells you you need to know what happened in that land plot. <laughs> you need an awful lot of information and intelligence to get there and understanding how the supply chain works. Um, and there is, an, there is a research and an, a capacity to mobilize the right people in the WTO forum. Of course, also in the OECD, but the WTO has the advantage that you have many more mem members. So I, I anticipate that there, that interest is, is, is going to increase. And then subsidies. And actually subsidies, we are actively promoting discussion of subsidies in the WTO reform. There's a reform we're proposing of the WTO. Um, we are not. Um, um, uh, we, are, we are qualifying this as positive. So the positive box is green transition subsidies, and negative. The negative one is, for example, fossil fuel subsidies. Um, in FTAs, um, this is probably where I mean FTAs. You have a bit more scope to do something because you're only talking with one partner. FTA is also an important channel platform for exchanges. We have biodiversity. We have that included in what we call the trade and sustainable development chapters. Um, that's, for example, an article on trade and biodiversity, that we uh, we agree on the importance of the conservation and sustainable management of biodiversity. Um, and uh, we commit to take relevant um, steps to combat illegal wildlife. So this is scientists. Huh? Um, and that we have to take action when trade or investment negatively affect biodiversity. This article has never been triggered, but it's an interesting article. And of course, we have an uh, effective implementation of multilateral environment agreement, which is an important article, uh, because the CBD, the mm -hmm. Biodiversity uh, Convention, and CITES are included in the trade agreements. And then we also have something on fisheries. We need to be an active member of the, I would have difficulties, RFMOs, regional fisheries management and then and this is what I thought interesting I, I've asked and others I've, otherwise I'll follow up so we have now for for every FTA we do a sustainable impact assessment and um, we develop together with each environment a new methodology to assess the impact of biodiversity 
Um, so given your economic background, I thought it's interesting, but I'll, I'll follow up and send to them. Then sort of, sort of a bit of policy discussion that we are having now. Um, so we had a review of our trade and sustainable development chapters in FTAs. Now you follow that. Big interest of the parliament. <laughs> Um, and there, there are two relevant aspects, I think, in this discussion. So um, one is uh, related to sort of the enforcement side, and the other is to what is already in the in the chapters uh, effective implementation of, of agreements. So let, let me first get to the enforcement. Um, uh, we now extended, so the TSD chapters had a dispute settlement mechanism, but not at par with the overall, mm -hmm. which meant two things, sanctions and also some um, uh, procedural things. So you would end the dispute settlement with a panel uh, verdict, but you could not monitor implementation. And the other is sanctions. So at this moment, now with the review, you have uh, ILO conventions and Paris subject to sanctions for um, material breaches, as we call it. So the question is, mm -hmm. is CBD Paris? That, that is, and I'll, I'll get back to that. Um, and the other I question is, um, is this global framework part of the effective implementation of the CBD in this case? Mm -hmm. Is, is that part of it? I would argue yes, but there, there may be people who say no. So there are two angles to look at how, because then we get back to all these targets, can you monitor that? We don't have the answer yet. <laughs> so uh, what we're doing at this moment is looking at what would be comparable to Paris material breaches. And mm. there are some similar similarities. So both Paris and, um, and the global framework for biodiversity are a landmark moment. They really make a significant change. They have targets, so uh, biodiversity has a flagship target 30 by 30, which is akin to 1.5 arguably uh, uh, temperature goal in Paris. Um, and there's also reducing net zero the loss of areas of high biodiversity importance. Mm -hmm. But the challenge is a bit that the level of commitment is different. Mm -hmm. Paris has much more shells on biodiversity shoots. Um, and there's a lack of quantitative objectives in the overarching long-term goals by 2050. So you have the 2030 targets quite clearly, but there's no quantifiable step for 2050, which may make it difficult to do material breaches. At the same time, ultimately, it, it is about what is a material breach. Now, you're not law students, you're economy mm. students. And a material breach means something serious. So um, it would mean that it defeats the purpose of the agreement. So to give you an example for Paris, it would mean I withdraw from Paris. That's mm. that's a material breach. Or you, you're, you're taking action that comes down to withdrawing. So I could imagine um, Brazil, one of its commitments is a very important commitment is on deforestation. So imagine that they now say, which there we have it with, um, I do away with that. Yeah. I could imagine that that becomes a material breach. So we are, we are full assessment of this. I know there's a political expectation um, and it is of course an important progress, um, the framework, but that, that's where we are. So there's a political expectation. Thank you very much for, for your introductory remarks. Uh, there is a political uh, expectation, <laughs> I, I guess, also from, from the European Parliament uh, in regard to that. So I, I, I would leave the floor now to, to, to you, <laughs> Saskia. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you, Madeleine, for setting the scene. And yes, you know uh, very well what I, but also the Parliament, because now we have a, an opinion um, from the Parliament on, on this, and it's true that the, the expectations of the Parliament are high. And why is that? Um, I think it all started uh, in the beginning of the mandate, when uh, the Commission adopted its Green Deal with different strategies, including a biodiversity strategy. And no need to go back in time uh, when we were uh, at the, the, in the middle of the pandemic and that we were working and were different and respective parliamentary committees. I asked Phil Hogan at that time, our former commissioner for trade, uh, 
uh, how it would take biodiversity into account in trade policies for the coming years in line with the Green Deal and the biodiversity strategy. And I entered the issue of um, zoonosis and the link between biodiversity loss, spread of pandemics such as the COVID and um, the impact of trade policies on uh, biodiversity loss. And he recognized somehow that he would have to dig into the topic because himself uh, had few knowledge about these links and how the uh, trade policy could uh, contribute to uh, biodiversity restoration and, and preservation. And this was really striking because, again, the context was such that at that moment, the, the World Health Organization already published different reports showing that biodiversity is a driver uh, for of a zoonotic pathogens such as the COVID, and that uh, there is scientific evidence that trade flows have impacts on uh, biodiversity loss, especially trade in minerals, trade in uh, agricultural goods, also because of the, the evolution of land use, uh, invasive uh, alien species, and over exploitation of resources, pollutions, etc. And so that's when we said, okay. Uh, International Trade Committee has to take position to issue an opinion on the strategy, um, biodiversity strategy, uh, because obviously uh, we have still work to do at EU level also to uh, include this aspect. And working on the issue more, and also with Marianne and others, uh, more uh, uh, figures uh, appeared and showed that indeed uh, for instance, 30% uh, of the global species threats are due to international trade. Um, and also that many species at risk of extinction uh, are, it's due to this evolution of land use. And so uh, the, the impact uh, that we have um, when it comes to agriculture. Um, and then we have other figures, which are also of interest for you, I think, uh, in the economic uh, dimension. And, and this is where awareness, I think, is also growing amongst the business sector, among investors, that for economic perspectives, uh, biodiversity loss needs to, take, to be taken into account because 50% uh, of the GDP relies on natural resources and their and the services uh, issued from from nature also the the world economic forum uh, one of the latest global risk reports points out that uh, biodiversity loss is the fourth just after climate the fourth global threat for um, the economic future so we see that it's all interlinked there is clearly a health issue natural dimension uh, the link, and, and I can come back on that in the Q&A, but the link also between our future on Earth as human species, um, because we need biodiversity to eat, uh, basically, uh, for our uh, food sector, uh, but also, uh, obviously, economic um, interlinks. And so this global crisis, because we usually talk about the climate crisis and, and, and climate uh, uh, future, but biodiversity is also uh, at stake and in a global biodiversity crisis that needs to be tackled throughout all EU policies, including, including trade. Uh, why is that? Because European uh, way of consuming, producing and uh, or transport patterns have detrimental impacts on uh, biodiversity. And Madeleine already addressed several instruments, several ways uh, of action. Uh, we also have in mind the uh, Corporate Sustainable Due Diligence yeah. Directive, uh, which obviously addresses uh, uh, the issue. Um, also the anti-deforestation uh, regulation. And these are steps in the in a positive way, in, in the good, uh, there are good steps and we have to acknowledge that. And this is uh, something that happened during this mandate also because of the, the political awareness that uh, grew since uh, the, the previous uh, mandates. But at the same time, 
drill faults are remaining. And, and we know that we need to act more through also FTAs, economic partnerships. And how can that uh, be done? Uh, some aspects uh, were already addressed by, by, um, by you, but um, first of all, from the parliament side, and this is the heart of the opinion that um, uh, the INTA committee gave, and, and I was rapporteur for the opinion, is to make the CDB an essential element as for the Paris Agreement. So to, to put it at heart of um, our FTAs and uh, link it to, of course, uh, specific and concrete provisions in order to monitor the implementation, to, to see whether uh, the partners indeed uh, apply um, their commitments. This is partly addressed through the TSD review. Um, in the TSD review, it was clear that biodiversity would be addressed if uh, international agreement um, and, and concrete steps were taken during the, the, the last COP, uh, what happened uh, during the Montreal uh, summit. Um, and now it remains to be seen how concretely uh, the Commission will also implement these commitments in the new FTAs, new economic partnerships, but also how this can be included in uh, existing ones. Uh, so to have specific provisions, implementation roadmaps based on the sustainability impact assessments, including uh, the biodiversity dimension. I think this is key uh, to assess uh, what's the situation and which questions need to be addressed. Is it deforestation? Is it land use? Is it uh, pesticides or altogether different elements. I think what we also need to, to reintroduce is the precautionary principle, uh, which is currently in, in purview to, um, yeah, not, not, not present enough in uh, the way uh, that's, that this is considered. Also, the role and the, the, the place, uh, the inclusion of indigenous people. Uh, this is key uh, for example um, in the negotiations and the implementation of the Mercosur agreement. Uh, why is that? Because indigenous people, if they're uh, less than 5% of the world population, they are responsible for 85% of, 80% um, sorry, of uh, the earth um, biodiversity in the forests, uh, deserts, uh, grasslands, marine environments. They uh, both rely, uh, rely on, on these uh, aspects to live, and they also um, suffer when uh, globally trade deforestation impacts uh, those areas negatively. So there are specific conventions, ILO Convention uh, 169, uh, addressing um, the question of uh, their, the, the indigenous people and respect of their integrity. There's also the Rotterdam Convention on uh, the uh, prior informed consent procedure for certain hazardous chemicals and pesticides international trade. There's also the resolution by the UN General Assembly uh, on the right to a healthy, inclusive and sustainable environment. So there are already different international conventions, agreements, uh, resolutions existing and that can be used as, as a reference. One other aspect, and please tell me if I'm completely exposing my time, okay? One Soon? Minute. One yeah. more minute, okay. Um, the, the MC13, uh, Ministerial Conference at WTO level, uh, is I think one of the next steps also where the EU can play a role by calling for further um, uh, coalitions of willing, uh, of, of countries willing to include binding levels of biodiversity protection uh, at um, yeah, the, the ministerial conference level, as has been done before, for instance, on plastic pollution, on uh, trade and sustainability, on the reform of the subsidies. Um, I will uh, uh, conclude by saying that there are two linked sectors with trade issues, which are the agricultural and the fisheries sector. Uh, I will not enter into detail, but we, come, we can come back uh, on, on those aspects. And uh, finally, maybe just to rebound on what uh, Madeleine just said on 
are we colo green colonialists or green protectionists? Um, imperialists. Imperialists. <laughs> we, 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 we can uh, have different uh, levels, but I really think here um, that it's also, there are three dimensions. The first one is all the elements that we are calling for are issued, are coming from international commitments, Convention on uh, Biological Diversity, Paris Agreement, uh, other uh, international conventions, and we are not uh, inventing our own uh, uh, approach towards uh, biodiversity or climate protection. This is one of the elements. The other element is also that biodiversity is of uh, public and general interest. Protecting biodiversity worldwide is ensuring our future on Earth, globally. And this is a matter of uh, emergency and all the policies need to converge towards um, better protection because humans, nature are closely interlinked and uh, we, we need to, to, to tackle this. And this is also through the One Health approach that we are step by step pushing for, uh, health of human beings, of nature all together uh, has a link. And this is uh, not in the opinion of INTA, but this is one of the next uh, issues I think we have to tackle uh, globally. Uh, wonderful. Uh, thank, thank you so much uh, for, for, for all those different ideas, what could further be, be, be done and, and also your, your opinion on well, what the Commission is all already doing. Um, so, so now after we, we've heard uh, what's happening on, on the bilateral, but also on the multilateral level, uh, we, we, we are also interested in, uh, Shunta, uh, what's uh, happening at the, at the OECD uh, and uh, what, what kind of perspective uh, on, uh, on the issue of uh, integration of biodiversity and, and trade policy uh, you, you have in Paris? Yes, uh, thank you very much, Simon, uh, for um, the invitation and also for letting me join this very distinguished panel. I already see a wealth of information coming out and it's extremely interesting for us. Maybe I'd like to start by saying that at the OECD, we haven't worked so much on the trade and biodiversity interface yet, um, because I think some of the interests of our members are uh, directed towards more uh, areas that have been investigated more clearly, such as trade in climate change or uh, trade in a circular economy. But we do want to see more emerging environmental topics being covered and looking at the trade interface. So we, we see that this, this is something potentially that will come into the picture more and more. Um, and I'd like to maybe approach this issue as a part of different strands of work that we've already done so far. So looking at the bilateral track that was um, already mentioned by the two uh, panelists um, on the work on regional trade agreements and the environment, and another strand of work on the nexus of illegal trade and environmental crime that we've been uh, working on in the past two years or so. But starting from the big picture, um, biodiversity is essential to sustain our economic activities and livelihoods through the provision of ecosystem services, food, water resources, pollution absorption, and climate stability. But at the same time, global biodiversity trends are on the decline. Uh, some figures say that they declined nearly by 40% from 1992 to, to uh, 2014. And in order to reverse these trends, we have seen uh, recent developments, including the Global Biodiversity Framework adopted at the COP15 last December, the EU Biodiversity for 2030, and the WTO Agreement on Fishery Subsidies. And these frameworks, I believe, will help to mainstream biodiversity across different economic sectors, including for trade. Um, and the question is to what extent these frameworks can actually help reverse the biodiversity decline. And turning to the trade linkages, which we're also grappling to understand better, uh, I guess it's generally understood that trade can have both positive and negative impacts on biodiversity. On the positive aspects, this could be on improved production efficiency that could alleviate impacts on biodiversity and ecosystems. Uh, 
while on the negative side, uh, they can also lead to increased economic activity that could uh, exacerbate impacts on the loss of ecosystem services and biodiversity, such as through land use change, pollution, and natural resource depletion. And the impacts of trade on biodiversity are really difficult to track in uh, global supply chains, but there are several pressure points to look at and where we could perhaps take action already. And one is the, in the area of environmentally harmful support measures that can exacerbate negative impacts related to production and harvest. Uh, for example, based on the OECD IEA estimates on uh, support for fossil fuels, we estimate that uh, in 2019, this has reached to up to 478 billion US dollars and also boosting unsustainable production and consumption in certain circumstances. Another area that we really need to focus on is in the area of environmental crime, which has been valued between 110 to 281 billion US dollars in 2018. And what is striking is that the figures are increasing. So they're increasing on average 8% per year. And this includes, for instance, areas such as wildlife trafficking, illegal timber, and um, also uh, on IUU fishing. Now, turning a little bit to uh, the bi um, bilateral um, uh, regional track and the role of regional trade agreements incorporating environmental objectives, we also see an uh, encouraging upward trend in this area. Uh, building on the trends database that was compiled by the Laval University of Canada, among the 775 regional trade agreements that they've recorded between 1947 and 2021, 671 agreements, so roughly around 87%, included at least one type of environmental provision as a part of the object um, uh, agreement, and the number of provisions are increasing more and more uh, as we go forward. Um, and there's a similar trend for biodiversity where 237 agreements, around 30% of all RTAs, include at least one reference to address biodiversity. And to unpack this further, 100, 106 regional trade agreements included references to multilateral environmental agreements uh, addressing biodiversity, such as the CBD, the Convention on Biological Diversity, and on CITES, the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species. Now, furthermore, apart from MEAs, uh, 225 RTAs included substantive provisions to address biodiversity, such as those on endangered species, invasive species, protected areas, genetic resources, environmental harmful subsidies, and illegal trade and environmental crime. And it's encouraging to see that these commitments have been made, but there's another question to what extent these provisions are actually implemented and whether they make a difference on the ground. And we have looked into this further by looking at um, uh, our work on illegal trade and environmental crime. And we found, find that some RTAs have been implemented in a way to address four specific pressure points. The first one is to improve domestic laws and regulations of trading partners to combat cross-border environmental crime, including areas of illegal logging, wildlife trafficking, and IUU fishing. There also, uh, the second point is their role to strengthen law enforcement by providing capacity building to judges, prosecutors, customs officials, um, also environmental um, regulators and local authorities to combat cross-border environmental crimes, such as in the case of um, uh, IUU fishing, illegal timber trade, and also on wildlife trafficking. There also is a role of strengthening implementation and enforcement of MEAs, in particular in the case of CITES. And finally, uh, they have a role in enhancing cooperation through dedicated institutional frameworks, and establishing public participation mechanisms to strengthen the link between private sector and civil society uh, that can help identify and target these crimes. So therefore, there are encouraging initiatives on the ground. However, we do need more work in this area, in particular, 
to improve the data and information, to increase transparency and traceability of trade and biodiversity impacts, and also to increase more understanding and awareness on these linkages. So that's briefly from my side, and I'm very much looking forward to further discussions on this. Um, I'd like to hand back to the floor to uh, Simon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shunta. And uh, we we need more work uh, in this area and also more more awareness. Uh, Marianne, you you are working in this area like both like uh, on the scientific part, uh, but but also on the, the the awareness part. So so I would uh, now hand hand over to you to to hear from from your experience uh, of your work. Thanks. Fantastic. Thank you, Simon. Um, thank you for inviting me. And it's absolutely a pleasure to be in the same panel with Madeline, uh, with Saskia and also Shunta. Um, so let's see what I can possibly say of interest after such a fantastic interventions by the others. Um, so I work on biodiversity and trade, and I thought that for the purposes of this particular event, and also reflecting, you know, the panelists who are fantastic trade experts, I might wear my biodiversity had slightly more than the trade had because I've worked on biodiversity around 20 years. So basically most of my career and it might be therefore re interesting to reflect from that perspective, the evolution of the role of trade and trade policy in supporting global biodiversity framework. So maybe that is something unique I can offer to the conversation that will be following as well. So I think it's fair to say that traditionally when thinking about the global biodiversity framework, um, the role of trade has been perhaps perceived more as a negative. The role of trade policy has been perceived as limited. So trade has been perceived more as a driver for the negative impact. And we did hear from Shunta earlier, and we come to that, that trade can be both positive and negative. So I'm simply saying traditionally, perhaps, you know, from the biodiversity perspective, the negative things have been more on the forefront. Um, and because of that, the trade rules and policies also, they've been perceived something that maybe treats environmental protection and biodiversity conservation more as a barrier to trade than something to work together. And building on these perceptions and also these realities in a way, the trade policy action, so policy action really through trade, has been more of a niche when it comes to thinking how can we implement EU biodiversity policy framework and also, of course, the global biodiversity policy framework. So that's kind of the tradition where we come from, but this is now changing and it's changing with, I feel, very promising speed. And that is basically what we hear from the panelists earlier uh, before I started. But I think to really appreciate where we're at, it's really good to know where we're coming from and also therefore see that there is really positivity in this change that we're now seeing, even if it sometimes feels too slow vis-a-vis -vis the challenge. So that's sort of, you know, the reflection that I wanted to start with. Um, then Madeline asked the question, what can trade do for biodiversity? What can trade do for the global biodiversity framework? I fully agree it's a complex matter and that's a very good question to ask. My short answer is that trade policy can do a lot. It can basically help to implement all the targets of the global biodiversity framework. And I'm saying this with confidence because that is the recent research or assessment rather that I've done with colleagues looking at all the 23 targets of the global biodiversity framework, working those through and looking at what role trade policy can play throughout them. So obviously there is no target for trade policy explicitly. Um, also trade as a word only features in some targets like wildlife trade, perhaps also invasive alien species. But when one works through the targets, you'll basically come to the conclusion that trade policy can play a role in delivering all of them. And to me, what really jumps out among the targets is, for example, the target number 10, which is a target about sustainable management of ecosystems. So we have global supply, supply chains and it feels that almost impossible imposs to think about that how can we achieve sustainable management of our ecosystems in the era of global supply chains without looking at trade policies that impact the landscape. And that's, you know, how trade really impacts, impacts very a key target um, that is of the global biodiversity framework. Um, agriculture expansion drives 88% of the global deforestation, 
That's the FAO study recently, and all that is underpinned by certain commodities, for example, that are traded globally, soy, palm oil, rubber, and so forth. So you think of it through that lens, obviously trade policy plays a big role in how we can sustainably use our ecosystems. Um, also, what has been already mentioned, uh, pollution, sustainable, sustainable consumption. They are key targets for pollution, uh, sustainable consumption in the global biodiversity framework. And as Madeline already worked this through, there is a lot of trade related issues and trade policy can play a role in supporting sustainable plastics trade, which has an explicit immediate uh, impact on uh, quality of ecosystems and therefore biodiversity. Um, and of course, sustainable consumption is foreseen to be delivered to a great extent through circular economy. And also that is a current trade policy issue. How can trade support circular economy more and also through that deliver benefits to ecosystems and biodiversity? So just to simply say, if you look at all the biodiversity uh, framework targets, you'll be able to see that trade policy plays a role directly or indirectly of all of them. And it's like a domino impact, because when you use trade policy, you use trade related standards to deliver sustainable agriculture, sustainable fisheries, you are also then, of course, abling the uh, conservation targets, the 30 by 30 targets and also the species conservation targets. So that is kind of the way we should really be seeing the trade policy's role in the global biodiversity framework context moving forward. And that hasn't been traditionally the case. And also the key thing that we have realized is, and wanted to show also through our analysis, that when we deliver biodiversity targets to trade, that also actually brings positive sustainable development impacts. So support sustainable trade, sustainable development. Um, so it is not one way street. It is a mutually supportive street as well, which is important to communicate um, to countries around the world. So that is just reflection on what can trade do for global biodiversity framework. It can do a lot. Um, I'm also going to say a few words about the WTO and um, particularly about the cooperation in the context of the WTO, because that is very important. So that touches upon, you know, what Madeline already uh, referred to and also um, earlier. So obviously countries can take measures related to trade and biodiversity on their own autonomously, as Madeline said, that's the European um, deforestation free regulation is an example of that. And of course, also European um, FTAs, free trade regulation, free trade agreements are an example of uh, taking action with a group of countries to trade agreements, um, including on biodiversity. But there's always going to be obviously impacts on other countries, no matter how um, autonomously you take your measures, which means that there's always going to be a bounce impact to the international arena to be discussing these issues. Um, and that really does bring us to the WTO and what is happening there at the moment. And uh, I think to many people who work in the space of environment and also uh, biodiversity, WTO often represents something where progress is slow uh, and it also represents something where there are a lot of disputes. But that is not what I want to highlight today, I really want to highlight the potential for cooperation. And I think that's also slightly what my uh, previous part, uh, fellow panelists have uh, alluded to. So obviously there is now the fisheries agreement and the fisheries agreement, so agreement on fisheries um, uh, subsidies, is a really important benchmark agreement. Um, and what needs to happen next is obviously to implement the agreement and move forward to the next phase, which will then be about looking at not only illegal fishing, but also unsustainable fishing. And uh, EU has been a champion of here in the past, and I'm hoping that EU will continue to be a champion here also moving forward, um, implementing the agreement and looking at also the broader unsustainable element of the, of the uh, fishing side. In addition to that, um, there is no dedicated negotiation going on linked to environment, climate, um, biodiversity and trade. But indeed, there are many discussions uh, which are aiming to bring cooperation between WTO members. Um, and one of, the, one of those is a trade and environment sustainable, sustainability structure discussions, which I reckon, you know, will be uh, discussed later. <laughs> yeah. um, and uh, 
as Madeline said, you know, this is where circular economy is being discussed. This is where environmental goods and services are being discussed and subsidies and climate and trade. And it is a fantastic space for WTO members. And EU has been a very active member here to seek cooperation, um, mutual interest areas to see how progress could be made in the trade space between partners. Um, biodiversity doesn't have its own working group or own sort of discussion. It features across all these different um, elements. And moving forward, I think what would be very important is that if biodiversity would be slightly more explicit, we would make proper links to biodiversity benefits and synergies to trade and in climate, for example, and environmental goods and services, circular economy. So that I think is going to be the next step. But you know, the um, foundation is already there, which is great. And I think that would be really helpful moving forward. So I'm going to conclude conclude here with my, I think, four recommendations where through an expert lens, I would recommend that EU would lead the way, make progress or where, you know, focus should be maybe in the most immediate future. And those include, firstly, the EU deforestation free regulation. It is a quite unique and globally globally quite unique regulation. It's a regulation which brings together trade, climate and biodiversity um, in a way, I suppose, that hasn't really done before. But it has, as already has been said, also provoked pushback from EU's trade partner countries, very understandably. It will be really important to get it right to really get the countries on board because it is such a globally pioneer, pioneering measure and the pressure is on. So focusing on that, you know, getting it right, um, I think that is uh, that it that will be important. It will also, I suppose, you know, put the precedence for the other uh, issues moving forward. Second thing, EU FTAs continue making progress. We've heard, you know, the progress that has already been made. There's definitely is progress there. So continue doing that. And I was really happy to hear Madeline mentioning the EU sustainability impact assessments and also the biodiversity methodology that has been developed. Um, I'm hoping to hear next it being also used frequently with the EU um, EU FDAs, for example, when looking at uh, monitoring them moving forward. I think that would be a real, real step forward. In a WTO context, definitely, I already said the fisheries agreement moving forward, um, looking at the unsustainable fishing, EU being a champion in that, and also in the context of the discussions at the um, trade, environmental sustainability, sustainability structured discussions, um, bringing biodiversity slightly more into the centre with the other topics that are also biodiversity related and relevant, like climate and also circular economy and subsidies. I think that would be really helpful for the biodiversity agenda. So with these thoughts, um, I'm going to hand back over to Simon and then look forward to having a discussion with you. Thank you so much, Mariana, uh, for, for, for those very, very concrete uh, four recommendations uh, for, for, for the European Union. Um, so uh, I think like m m many things are happening on uh, on different levels and different organizations, of course. Um, so I think uh, like four of them maybe stood out for, for, for me personally, like one was the actually the, the role of third countries and uh, and the impact on uh, on third countries uh, the second one was about implementation uh like both of uh, ftas but but also those multilateral frameworks uh the the third one about the the complexity so what do we actually know about uh, the, the the real impact uh, and 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 the fourth one a bit about uh, positive and negative impacts uh, in regard to how can we actually decrease the negative impact uh, of trade on biodiversity and how, how can we increase the, 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 the positive uh, impact of trade on biodiversity. So uh, if I if I turn to you, Madeleine, so I, I was wondering, Saskia was telling us uh, that, of course, biodiversity is kind of a, a, a global public uh, interest and, and there are already like these international commitments uh, out there in different kind of treaties. And, and, and Shunta mentioned that they are also included frequently in, uh, in those agreements. So, so I was wondering when you negotiate uh, trade agreements with third countries, uh, how, how is the reaction of third countries when you are proposing uh, to, to implement, uh, to, to integrate also environmental provisions? 
in, in, in those agreements. Uh, so how e easy is it? Is it is it more kind of a unilateral EU endeavor or is it like more kind of a shared interest and you are trying to figure out the, the, the best mechanism, how, how the trade agreement uh, could support uh, environmental goals here? Gosh, this is a question I think you could spend 10 podcasts on it. <laughs> um, I'm saying that because, uh, I mean, we've, we've had <laughs> an enormous evolution. And I, I, I pick up on Saskia, I think five years ago, the word climate was taboo. The Americans would say, don't say the C word. Mm -hmm. um, today we talk about it. I see resistance. Huh? So now everybody agrees that we should have these commitments, but I'm attacked on CBAM and deforestation. Mm -hmm. with uh, incredible arguments by China and India who say, I should have an environment exception, the development exception, and you should not apply these measures to us. No, this is an implementation of our international commitments under Paris to do CBAM because there's um, we have all the explanations of it. But this means that in trade terms and in the trade community, there's not yet an acceptance that you need to go through a mental and policy change. It is not trade for the sake of everything is on its own planet. No, it is there to support other objectives. And that's a mental change that you then feel. This is why many countries say, when it comes to it, yeah, but this is an NTB, this is a non-tariff barrier. And you need to say, no, no, the question is not if I can take this measure, but how I do it. And do I collaborate with you? So for, for what we are trying to do, take the deforestation, whether it's in the WTO or here, and it's very important what you say. So don't only hammer with your stick. I put you subject to sanctions. No, how do you cooperate? So I have this measure, but I thought about it. And in the design of it, I thought about this third country and SMEs in the EU, of course. How are you going to implement this? So then the discussion becomes much more. And this is the signal we try to give in WTO. We want to discuss with you on how we can implement this in a way that we can collaborate on that. And we find it more useful to have a discussion of best practices. This is my way of doing it. Do you have another way of doing these international to, 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 to tackle land uh, forest degradation and other things? Let's talk about it. Who knows in five years time we want to be inspired on your legislation. But you, you need to, to bet in and it's not enough to say all I do is and base myself on international standards because for deforestation, frankly speaking, creative, we build on it, we go further. So the countries will say, yeah, but this you need to discuss in FAO and, and I don't know where. And um, then we say, yeah, but it's too slow. There's an urgency here. We have to do it. So you can do that. You can take this type of measure, but you need to explain it. But I want to work with you on how we implement it. And ultimately, I want to work in this international environmental setting to develop these international standards. So that's a bit, yes, you have resistance, but you, you really need to, to, to play on both. And it's inevitable if you're a front leader, you're always, uh, you, you, you shouldn't be defensive and, and you, you need to take it as a challenge to how, how you do it. So for example, now in June, we're going to set up two dedicated sessions, full teams from Brussels will join us, one on deforestation and one on CBAM, and everybody can come and talk with us. Um. Everybody can come and, and, no, and talk. No, they, they, uh, they, they, they want to tell <laughs> oh, this is a okay, okay, barrier okay. and I, I started yeah, WTOK. Yeah, yeah. okay. I, I, I was also a bit wondering about like in, in your earlier intervention, you, you you mentioned that like one one of the um, one of the kind of natural measures uh, in in the context of the WTO would be actually trade liberalization. So now if I, I know you are like more looking on the uh, on the FTA yeah. part, uh, but if we if we look on the WTO agreement uh, or the proposed agreement uh, on, on green good liberalization yeah. is kind of a which I would assume is kind of a long low hanging fruit uh, in a context which is focused on, on, on liberalization. Why, why has it been so difficult yeah. to, well, to achieve that, uh, you can uh, have to achieve that. Um, So um, I think there are two reasons. Uh, the first is really a big, big reason triggered by what we have now. So basically, liberalization, environmental friendly goods and, and services, it's renewables, it's solar panel, it's a windmill, it's, it's, it's um, these type of products. Um, we are making them. US is making them, China is making them with a bit of um, unfair practices. Um, today, when I, when I tell we want to liberalize it as a contribution to climate. 
what will the Colombians and the others of this world say? They say, you know what? I want your technologies. I want my own industrial policy and development because I want to make these things in my country. Like, mm -hmm. why should I reduce a tariff so that I, I can import and remain dependent on you and remain? I think that, that philosophically that, that is behind. It's a bit a, a short summary of it, but you have this enormous resistance from developing countries you see there's no gain in it for me mm -hmm. um uh, and then then i think the 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 other reason for me is inherently you cannot only deal with tariffs you need to package this with the non-tariff part so the non-tariff barriers part if you want unfair trade practices uh, and where we come from is that we would define an environmental good on the basis of the end use of the product this, this is where we left it in 2016. And that is because we didn't have a way to define differently a product. But how do I know that this solar panel is friendly? What dirty mines, raw materials are there in there? Um, so this brings you to all the type of measures we're taking now, the PPMs, to, you look at how products are produced. And today we don't have in a, a proper system to distinguish between good. I, I mean, I can liberalize steel, but I cannot liberalize steel and say, okay, I only liberalize green steel. You, you would need a customs code at entry and, and you would need to be able to recognize that product. Probably at some point we will develop a methodology because this is why you need to combine the liberalization with something of a rule and understanding that what you've done with steel is indeed clean because it has been produced in a certain way or it is uh, you, you will need to be able and and i think this is one of the reasons we are a bit stuck so our vision would be you can do the liberalization agenda if we have clear guidelines that everybody needs to develop rules um, to make sure that what they produce is clean I, I i put it in a very simplified way i think these are the two reasons for making it uh, difficult to, to advance Okay. Uh, thank, thank you very much. There are um, many more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> of course. Um, and the government would be really happy if the commission could uh, advance it. Could, advance could, it. Could <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> I, I, I was also wondering about like uh, when when you were hearing like those uh, proposals uh, expressed by by Marianne, uh, like those four recommendations. Where where do you think the the, the parliament uh, was would actually like kind of su su support those notions and um, may maybe more uh, on uh, on the second broad issue on on implementation uh, if we if we remember that like one of the main issues for the biodiversity uh, IC targets was that there were there, there was also a, a, a lack of implementation and also Shuntat raised this issue that okay we see more we see an increase of language uh, on uh, on environmental, but also on biodiversity issues in in FTAs. Uh, so so how can we how can we make sure that those things uh, are not just appearing in the uh, in the agreement, but but are actually implemented? Yeah. <laughs> how? <laughs> um, the four recommendations put forward by Marianne, but also the recommendations put forward by Shunta. I think. When you compile them uh, and you take a look to the opinion that uh, the Parliament gave on the uh, uh, strategy for biodiversity, I, I don't know exactly the title, but uh, biodiversity strategy and the interrelated recommendations, they are all in. Uh, when it comes to, you know, at the starting point, when you start negotiating or even before during the scoping exercise, if you have uh, SIA, Sustainability Impact Assessment, digging into the different parts, because here we're talking specifically about biodiversity, but the idea is sustainability as, as a whole uh, that needs to be addressed through FTAs and to see, okay, which are the main uh, challenges, the main uh, uh, fields of action that needs to be addressed during the negotiations and to make it clear from start that those issues are on the table and need to be addressed also through uh, uh, trade policies. Um, this is also, in my view, about policy coherence, because we know that DG INSPA, uh, through uh, development cooperation, for instance, is addressing those uh, biodiversity or climate-related uh, issues, or to restore other uh, agricultural practices 
in order to avoid biodiversity loss through agriculture, etc. And so this is the whole paradox of our approach. Uh, it's to say, okay, on the one hand, we have um, specific projects addressing biodiversity loss, but on the other hand, we know that through trade policy, uh, there might be adverse effects. And so it's also about coherence between what we do on the one hand and what we can do on the other hand to make trade contribute to those uh, commitments. And I think this is also where, and I don't say it easy, Madeleine, because I know that uh, 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 negotiating with partners is not something, you know, it's easy to say, okay, what needs to be done? And then when, when negotiations start, of course, if in front of you, you have a, a partner that doesn't really want to do it, it's, it's not easy, easy, easy game. But nevertheless, to, to try to build the partnership and to see to show the win-win situation uh, because biodiversity loss is also a key issue uh, socially, economically, for uh, many countries in Africa, in Latin America, and they are the first facing global warming and, and, and uh, climate challenges linked to biodiversity loss also when it comes to agriculture, when it comes to all the areas, water scarcity, effects on, on, on um, population, etc. And so I think this is one of the key recommendations because it's on, on the in the very beginning of the process to have this impact assessment and uh, in involving, and we haven't talked about it much, involving civil society. I think it's Shunta that pointed that. Uh, I think this is key because who knows better what's going on than civil society partners when it comes to all the different parts that we as parliament want to address through the TSD review also, uh, it, it's partly done, but workers' rights, social aspects, gender issues, biodiversity, climate, uh, all those trade-related aspects that we want to, to address globally. I think this is also something um, key, again, not easy because civil society is structured in the EU. We, we have structured civil society organizations, trade unions, uh, uh, and it's easy to, to have uh, dialogue with them and, and, and structural contacts. It's not always the same when it comes to the partner countries where sometimes the official authorities do not want to reach uh, out towards their own civil society or civil society is not organized and so it's also a part of the challenge but i'm coming back from a mission to south africa and what we've seen when we met with civil society actors is that they acknowledge also and they need support from the eu when it comes to tackling climate change biodiversity loss because they they see uh, what's what's happening uh, in their country and uh, they need also impulse and they say, OK, it can be through trade relations, through the, the modernization of the economic partnership that the EU has with South Africa, for instance, in order to address those issues. Because coming from the government, we do not have support for the projects that we lead on the ground. And so the EU can also be an ally and, and somehow uh, um, uh, rely on civil society actors to uh, convince the local authorities to uh, include those aspects and biodiversity uh, in, in the negotiations of uh, trade agreements, economic partnerships. And I don't come back on, on all the recommendations because I think they're the sh they are almost all in the in the opinion, uh, the INTA opinion, including training. Uh, so it makes sense what you say. <laughs> Um, because we see that it's also a question not only, but also a question of implementation, of training, of expertise, and this needs also to be uh, addressed. Can I make, make my one point? Yes, it, it, it is, of course, uh, quite difficult because you're busy with dynamics. So there's an environment world with its dynamic rule setting, and then you have the trade world. That's, of course, interaction with that trade takes place. but. Ideally, our philosophy, and that's also what you say, we want international rules. And we are dealing with global problems and our FTAs doesn't cover the whole world. So you, you want this global setting. Paris was very important for us as trade community because you had a quite clear framework. Uh, and 
the ratchet clause, I don't know if I speak too technical now, but there's a self-improving, there are things you can monitor. There are things that you can say, okay, I'm using my leverage and say, ah, you didn't, you didn't comply with. I know it's even easier. You have one organization, you have monitoring structure, and we, we had a case now already. But biodiversity is very challenging because it's now that we have this overall framework. Um, so you need a certain dynamism. I mean, fine negotiations, but most FTAs are in place, and it's not that every day you can negotiate a, a review. So you need to. You, this is why I made this little comment on: is is this the effective implementation of the CBD? Because then it becomes more interesting. Then you can say, ah, it's already covered because this is this built-in dynamism in in the agreement. And then you need to think about, I don't know. I mean, you can always make uh, joint uh, interpretive note. You can always do do types of thing, but this is the challenge because it cannot be the trade community that fixes. And I see the dilemma in, for example, the plastics discussion we were discussing. So there's indeed a plastics plurinatural um, initiative. And with our environment colleagues, we actually have to push them to come a little bit more and do more in the WTO because it's really, we have a very um, active framework because we are designing these rules internationally. We're talking about establishing a new agreement on plastics. And it's very difficult to say what you want in the trade in terms of commitment that doesn't consolidate it there. Um, and and this, this is the fascinating part of this. We, I, I really think, and this is where I totally come with you, this, this cooperation that I mentioned, this really the search in how these policies interact with each other and how you can reinforce is very dynamic and extremely interesting. Uh, which doesn't mean you, you shouldn't go on, on the using the FTAs and, and monitoring, but it, it's so important that you have a clear international framework. Yes, um, so to, to have an international uh, fr framework is of course very, very important to somehow know what we are doing, where well, what's also what one one of the aspects I think emerging from from the discussion. So 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 maybe uh, Marianne or or or, or Shunta. Um, so we were discussing about the the, the complexity. So um, Shunta, you also mentioned that uh, like the the OECD is uh, is basically only starting to 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 work on uh, these uh, like on biodiversity more specifically. So I. I, I was wondering, um, like, where would be like main uh, knowledge gaps? Um, I mean, we are also, of course, in uh, uh, in an academic setting here. So, uh, what what kind of uh, knowledge gaps do do you actually see, like, uh, both both of you, like uh, Shunta or, or, or Marianne, um, like to um, more more specifically like be able to to engage with uh, trade and uh, and biodiversity can you maybe turn the screen back on so we can see yes the um, oh. <laughs> oh, yes <laughs> great yes Simon so maybe if I may re provide some initial reflections and then Marianne can provide a more comprehensive re response um, but um, I think what, what is lacking in terms of getting the trade in biodiversity nexus onto the radar of different environmental policy makers or, or people working on trade in environment is that maybe the linkages are, are not entirely clear. And for us, especially working on in the environment directorate, we do want to mainstream environmental challenges and looking at the global dimension or the trade dimensions so that they go hand in hand. And we clearly see that biodiversity is one of the things that would need to be discussed uh, as we go forward. But um, when I actually have some bilateral discussions with our members, well, some, some people would immediately make the link that um, these, these need to be addressed together, while some others might not understand the linkages immediately. And maybe, um, as Marianne uh, mentioned in her very uh, first remarks, that um, the, the trade in biodiversity nexus is sort of seen as a negative thing, like um, addressing biodiversity is negative to trade, and therefore they're, they're le um, less win-win opportunities. 
And in order to maybe reverse this, I think we really need to get back to the basics. Why, why we are trying to do these things. Um, I think um, um, there were earlier mentioning from Saskia that um, this is needed because um, this is of the interest of the um, global public interest to address these issues, also to, to um, reach international commitments. And I think it, it also also boils down to um, what we are trying to achieve in the end. Do you want more trade liberalization or do you want more economic integration for economic growth or more broadly to enhance our prosperity? And if we focus on this prosperity lens more, then it's, it's quite obvious that you, you cannot leave any externalities aside. You, you need to discuss them together. But um, you, I think we still need to, to discuss these basics to, to lay the ground to, to go forward. Um, I'll stop here for now. Thank you, Shunta. Yes. Please. Yeah, shall I take over very squarely on what Chunda said? So I think looking at it from the perspective of um, biodiversity expert, um, and this really does also come from experience, um, I think biodiversity experts, uh, experts as a whole don't really quite understand trade policy. You know, they work, it works on a certain logic. Uh, it can be quite daunting, particularly the, uh, you know, the um, global um, international trade policy rules. So there is that certain element of really not quite understanding what they can do for you. Um, and that is then the discussion to be had, you know, um, with the help of experts who've kind of, you know, made that leap, but also hopefully with the patience of the trade policy experts and, and you know, the uh, um, working for at the Commission on, and at the WTO to really be able to have those conversations. And it will take that while because, you know, I think otherwise it's it, what you'll get from the biodiversity community is recommendations that don't make sense <laughs> because there is no understanding of, you know, how the trade policy instruments can work for work. And therefore, you know, it can even even come across unhelpful because, you know, in reality, if you are negotiating something, for example, bilaterally with the FTAs or a WTO, um, certain things that don't quite don't quite work or certain asks are unreasonable but you can find a way to do something if you if you know what you you know would be able able to do that so that's one thing it's a, it's a making biodiversity experts working on biodiversity issues perhaps more trade policy literate and late policy policy measure literate and studies can help there, or perhaps rather than studies, assessments, you know, that, for example, work through and explain what are PPMs, <laughs> um, how do they work, and what do they mean for sustainable agriculture. And I've, I think, you know, even in this call, you know, I see, saw some, some names who've been providing fantastic research on this, uh, case studies on this, which are very helpful. Then, from the perspective of trade, trade experts, I have the feeling that there isn't enough understanding of the positive potential on addressing biodiversity conservation issues and how it can really bring positive returns to sustainable trade and the, through that to sustainable development. And I think particularly in a quantitative terms, I've been certainly searching through the internet and the studies trying to find evidence that would have been quantified when you take this kind of trade policy biodiversity action, what it will yield to in terms of benefits to businesses, benefits to sustainable um, su supply chains or something similar. So I'm sure that must be possible to do something also more quantifiable in this space, because I do feel that is also the language that will then convince a number of broader uh, people who have worked on trade for their all their lives and also perhaps work more on the trade liberalisation agenda than something else. So those kinds of knowledge slash understanding gaps is what I've been observing throughout, you know, working in this interface for a while. Great. Uh, so uh, something to, to learn on uh, on either side. Uh, so to um, maybe address some of the understanding gaps, uh, which which we still have maybe in the audience. So I, I, I would like to open now for, for, for Q&A, like either in the room or in the chat. Uh, um, People online, you are also welcome to uh, switch on your your, your camera and uh, ask a question uh, directly to to the panelists here. Uh, so I would just uh, open the floor now. And 